Sometimes karma takes too long. Let's do it now. In this episode, bully neighbors get a crazier one. Wrongfully fired employee snitches on the company. Abusive man gets abused by karma and corrupt bosses get to pay a butthole tax. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. I bought a house with the intention of doing a flip. When I moved in, the self-appointed block captain let me know who they were. Sadly, they were my next door neighbors. I tried to be friendly, but listening to them made me realize how horrible they were and I tried to stay civil. My significant other kept saying just wait for it to be our turn. They bragged about, forcing people to make improvements on their houses through their contacts with the city, getting undesirable renters out of the houses and just harassing people in general. I as I worked on flipping my house, the wife became a worse thorn in my side. To start, she demanded I put up a fence so people would quit cutting though my yard and scaring her. Then, her and the husband demanded I take care of the weeds in the yard or they will do it and bill me. After that a storm blew my tree over and a big branch scraped their shingles, they asked for $1,200 to replace them. The tree was there before I moved in and because of the property line. They are responsible to cut back the branches to their side of the property line. When I wouldn't pay they had a relative jump my fence and cut the trees down. Needless to say, I began to ignore them so she became a constant nag and moved on to another target. Then one day as I was tearing down my deck for a patio, I realized she put a feral cat colony on a section of my property, I had wondered why all the stray cats were around and I finally found out. I reached out to the city and demanded it be removed, but they said she followed the law on getting it in place. As I tried to get it shut down, she began acting unhinged when standing in her windows while staring at me, yelling out the window at me too, hitting the fence with items to scare my dog. Here my revenge started. I started by filing a HRO slash harassment restraining order against the wife and had it granted ex party with the evidence I provided, of course she contested as it was defamatory to her character. Before the hearing the husband tried to physically intimidate me. So I filed one against him and it was also granted ex party. In the hearing it came up that there was an HRO against the husband as well, they dogged being served until I had it published as a means of service. I started to make complaints about them and their house. Also, I made police calls when necessary. As I did this the other neighbors began to realize they could do to them what they had done to them and others. For example, as I was having my front door replaced, needing a building work permit. I knew they were doing internal remodeling so I called a city inspector and they were fined for not a having permit. As she ran it at the inspector, he looked at my window and saw I had mine displayed. Their back porch became hoarded so I made another call to a city inspector and they had to clear it out. Then they had a broken window on the porch door so I called an inspector and they had to replace the door. Next the paint on their house was peeling so I called an inspector and they had to repaint. The inspector also found the wood underneath was rotted along with their front porch was sloping. So, they needed to fix the front porch sections of wood and repaint. Through all this they had set up cameras to prove they were not doing the things I said i.e. hitting the fence. They also pointed a camera at my backyard. As it was legal to point a camera into my yard and a part of my HRO was her intrusive watching behaviors, I gave the camera the middle finger on my way to and from my garage. When she complained, with the city board being tired of her, their response was she was admitting to intrusively watching me. The fight over the cat colony came to an end when I realized one of the cats had a serious disease and I began to capture them and turn them into animal control. Don't worry, animal control was part of the feral cat program, so they would not be put down but the neighbor would have to pay a fine to get each cat out or have the colony closed. Finally I caught the sick one and it had rabies, part of the program was for her to capture each new cat and have it vaccinated. She admitted to willingly choosing not to vaccinate the cats on her go fund for the colony. I soon had the go fund shut down when I provided the evidence she was not using the funds as she stated they were going to be used. The city now had to act to close the colony, the person at animal control who wouldn't respond to my complaints was fired. The neighbors called in a city mediator who we met with, presented all the evidence and said we would not meet with them, and provided extremely racist tweets they made about neighbors. 
the city cut ties with them as community leaders. With their power to bully gone and having spent what I can only imagine in fines and repairs, like they did to numerous other neighbors. After 14 years they sold their house and moved out, way out to the suburbs where they only have one neighbor about 50 yards away. They knew I was wrapping up my flip and would be out in less than a year. Without being able to bully their neighbors, without people having their back, they seemed to have no further reason to stay. Needless to say, I did several more things to wear them down. Finally, when I listed my house, it was sold while theirs was still on the market. As a final F you to them I reported to the county they had both the new and old house listed as their homestead, meaning they were paying less in property taxes so they got hidden with more fines on my way out. I worked at a retail chain that sold pet supplies and products. When I started working there it was great, family owned and everyone I worked with was fantastic. The owners eventually wanted to retire and sold the small chain to an investment group. Once the investment group took over, almost all but a few employees were let go, forced out or just quit. I hung on for a little while longer before I got promoted at my other job. New company brings in new manager to my store. My store was the top performing store in the entire chain, bringing in about $10,000 to $12,000 a day on average. It was always more on weekends and especially around the holidays. The new manager is a Mr. Company man, company told him they only want employees around for two to three years, myself and two others had been there 10 plus years. So naturally he began ruffling feathers and giving us all a hard time. Unfortunately he decided on me first. Mr. Company man found out I worked two jobs. The two jobs are not in related fields so there was no chance of any conflicts of interest on my end. However, my second job requires me to work nights and weekends. When Mr. Company man found this out he demanded I work nights slash weekends there, so it was fair for everyone. I didn't work nights and weekends there, because I was that store's only certified forklift operator, and deliveries didn't come at night, they came weekday mornings, every day. Mr. Company man didn't want to hear that, and told me I either had to work nights and weekends, or that day would be my last day. I told him, don't threaten me with a good time, I suppose today is my last day then. I was pretty pissed about that, but it's not a big deal now, ended up being the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I went home early, didn't finish my shift, because fuck them. But when I got home I decided to call my local inspector and report them for not having a certified operator on staff, as well as numerous other hazards. Needless to say, they lost close to three weeks profit from all the violations the inspector found. I was surprised they even showed up. In my state the inspector will call you back after an inspection and tell you if your claims were founded or not. Mine were. And Mr. Company man got his ass chewed out so bad he ended up quitting. Around a year ago, I moved into a new apartment, not in a great part of the city, but could be considered average. When I first moved in, I was assured everything would be rosy, and I'd be left to my own devices. Enter, fuckhead. Fuckhead is, as his name suggests, a total piece of doo-doo. He has shared custody of his son and he absolutely loves to get plastered and scream at the kid, either via phone, or in person. The kid is around 13 I think, and his name's not totally important, mainly because the kid's got enough grief. This went on for about two to three months so I tried befriending fuckhead, mostly because I'm an idiot, but also to find out just what his issue was, because having earphones and on max volume while listening to heavy metal, and still being able to hear fuckhead screaming was becoming an issue, to say the least. I put up with it for a bit, mentioning it in passing to who I guess is my building manager? He's really just a guy that's lived there for years and is mates with the landlord and he's retired so can't really blame him for not wanting to get involved. He did mention that Fuckhead had lived here for about five years and had numerous complaints, including the previous tenant, who'd moved out because she'd had enough of his bullshit. He also mentioned that Fuckhead had shared custody, because Fuckhead's ex was also a bit of a twat. An absolute Christload of social workers were involved, that poor kid. Anyways one day Fuckhead was screaming at the top of his lungs again, and again, because I'm an idiot. I poked the ceiling with a broom. Just a little tap to say, hey friend, 
just a quick polite note to tell you that the whole fucking neighborhood can hear you, which was greeted by five thuds that sounded like fuckhead was about to bunker bust clean through the ceiling. This naturally pissed me off, so I knocked his door, and he simply opened it and told me to fuck off. Fair enough I thought, as I frankly had better shit to do so I went for a walk. Upon return, fuckhead is putting his bins out and starts to give me grief, which I returned in kind, causing him to square up to me, and threatened to kill me. I held my ground and he started going on about respect and shit, and told me, he held all the cards and there was nothing I could do. Unfortunate, but I simply said, if that's how you wanna be, then that's how it is and left him to have his little bitch fit outside. First call was to the police, who took it surprisingly seriously. They came out within an hour and we sat in the panda car and discussed all of fuckhead's transgressions, a lot of which I had recorded, mainly to WhatsApp to my friends like, hey, dickhead is at it again. They took a statement, said there was likely nothing they could do but they might investigate fuckhead on the count of the child abuse and the social worker in place. I then asked them if evidence would help, and they replied it'd save them a lot of time if I could get some, but would need to be recent. Last three months okay? Sure they say, but three months is a long time, and he might have changed. No Mr. Police Officer, I mean covering the last three months. Excited he was, to say the least. So they brought me to the station to give a statement and to copy all the evidence off my phone, at this point, big shout out to old phones and removable SD cards, as I really didn't want to explain my meme collection. They spent the next two maybe three months investigating fuckhead, as there's a lot of banging to be heard in the videos, which I can only assume is fuckhead assuming his final fuckhead form. A few months go by and I'm seeing a lot of, open immediately, do not ignore type letters arriving in fuckhead's name, which I think might be from the social workers, but not sure. I do feel particularly bad about this bit, as being a violently abusive alcoholic, he's not quite smart enough to realize it's me that's making his life suck, because the social are on him like a skid mark on a toilet, and he's just screaming at his kid even more, because he thinks the kid has grasped him up. Eventually the police have everything in place and serve him with some sort of behavioral order or something like that, which frankly wasn't a whole lot, but that was more an aperitif for the meal the social were about to make. Yesterday, armed with a bunch of evidence, a bunch of people, two uniformed officers and my landlord, they arrived at his flat. Partly because that's the only time my landlord had free, and probably partly because Saturday pay for cops and social workers must be fairly decent. Also partly because he has his kid on weekends. Actually probably the main reason, now that I think about it. Since fuckhead has the kind of voice that makes Brian Blessed sound like a cross between a mime and a church mouse, they can hear everything immediately. They go up into the tight hallways, which is kind of funny because they're all trying to social distance, so it kinda looks like they're queuing up to give fuckhead a bollocking, in true British fashion. It ended with fuckhead being led away in cuffs, because of course he fought back, the guy's a fucktard, it's totally in his nature. He came back today, with a very defeated look on his face. Turns out the behavior order was a bit of a warning and they've been watching the house on and off all week, and they've heard some of the Dolby surround phone conversations and have now charged him with a bunch of doo-doo I frankly don't understand. Firstly, no more contact with his kid, a minor victory since his mom is a bit of a cunt, but they're under a microscope now so maybe that'll help. Secondly, my landlord was especially not chill about being contacted by both me and the police regarding fuckhead. So he is using one of the charges or something to speed up the eviction process, meaning it's not the current six-month COVID guidelines. Thirdly, he's going to have to go in tomorrow and tell his boss that he's gonna need multiple dates off in the possible near future for court dates etc. Nice. Tough break in this economy. That's likely gonna cost too. Especially since I've seen a bunch of letters from the Provident arriving for him. For those outside the UK, the Provident is kinda like the OG version of those short-term loans with insane interest rates. All this could have been avoided had fuckhead just not been, well, a fuckhead. At least in two weeks or so I might be able to have a decent night's sleep if it's not ruined by a 2am ambulance siren or that asshole with a 3-inch exhaust on his Civic. Might be time for me to move, either way. This story was told to me by a friend and is about her father. 
it takes place around 2005. This happens in Sweden, where there's no at-will employment. Once an employee is past the initial six-month probation period, you can't fire them without a cause, which also requires an established paper trail. My friend's father was a mechanical engineer. He was around 55 when this happened and very experienced in his field. In fact, he had some skill sets that were close to unique, to the extent that you might be able to replicate them, but at extreme costs. We're talking multiple people from multiple companies from multiple countries taking weeks if not months to get up to speed with specific projects to do the same things. He was also a no bullshit kind of guy who did his job, did it well but also pointed out problems and expected others to point out problems to him. He was extremely solution oriented and had no time for office politics or keeping a positive attitude at work. Basically, your everyday grumpy older engineer who really knew his thing and always ready to help if you asked, but not very forthcoming in team building exercises and so on. He also ran his own business on the side, doing minor projects and so on. As was required by his employer, he had reported this and was sure to not cause any conflicts of interests, so his employer knew and accepted this. He was considered a valuable employee and got several awards that he cared little for, but anyway. During his many years with this employer, by all accounts, they paid him well, respected his knowledge and accommodated his style and he returned the favor by working very hard and making sure to mentor younger and newly employed engineers, to make them effective co-workers. Then his firm was acquired by a larger firm, and a new management team installed. Initially, everyone was promised that things would remain the same, but with the new management came a new office culture. The new management pressured for unpaid overtime, for a more American corporate culture with cheering and clapping and so on. He considered it extremely cringe and refused to participate. His status as a long-standing and knowledgeable employee kept him safe for some time, before the new management realized that resistance to the new culture centered around him and started pressuring him to play along. When he did not, they turned increasingly hostile, realizing that he held a lot of soft power in the company, having mentored a large percentage of the engineers and resistance to their leadership centering around him. They started ordering him to work overtime, he answered that he was on time with his projects and that if they had identified an emergency requiring overtime, they would have to bring it up with the union to negotiate the overtime and make sure it was an actual emergency. They tried to force him to participate in the cheering and clapping by making it mandatory for him to attend and yelling at him to participate, he did but so unenthusiastically that the event turned even more cringe and people started laughing. The workday turned more and more hostile, and he knew that things would come to head sooner or later. Being an experienced engineer and knowing how to document things, he already had his ducks in a row. Then it finally happened. They caught him answering an email for his side business on his work laptop, brought him in and fired him on the spot for theft of company resources. He sat at the conference table and looked the three managers in their eyes, one after the other and asked. Are you sure you want to do this? They all said yes. Are you really sure you want to do this? He was escorted to his desk by security to leave his phone, his badge and his computer at the desk and was then escorted out. Once out of the building, he phoned his union representative, who immediately cancelled the firing, claiming there was no just cause, which meant that it would go to the labor board for arbitration. You see, the company had an IT policy that it was okay to use the company laptop for personal business, including a side business, as long as you were on a break and compliant with IT security protocols, and the company was aware of and had approved his side business. And he was on a break. Of course, he had his declaration of a side business, signed by his former manager, and the IT policy available and sent both to the union representative. Then he called his lawyer and asked him to send the pre-prepared cease and desist on two patents he held, patents that were not that significant and nothing he could make any serious money out of since they were mostly for very specific things used by the solutions he designed and used at his employers, but still his that he had brought with him into the employment and allowed the employer to use in exchange for a slightly higher pay. Then he went home for some vacation and tending his side business. He was always a man to prepare and had enough money saved up to last him for a good time, to the extent that he considered retiring entirely. My friend said he had two job offers from competitors that had looked to sniping him for some time within the week, basically as soon as they learned he was available. 
He was gracious, but declined, but offered them to consult with his side business, now that he had the time, which they eagerly accepted. At twice the hourly rate he had made at his earlier employers. His colleagues started ringing the day after for advice, since the projects he had managed could not go on without him, he was perfectly polite, but denied any information and help, saying he had left everything he had with management and to contact them, as he was no longer employed there. Several clients that phoned his private number were told the same thing. Since his private number was not on a public registry, he suspected that both colleagues and clients spent some time and or money to find it. It took two weeks before a manager phoned him and asked things. He politely declined to answer, got yelled at and replied with something like, I am sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone who works for you. And hung up. This happened a few times, and the next week HR phoned him and stated the firing had been a mistake and he was welcome back to his job. He again politely declined, saying that he awaited the labor board's decision, but until then he was happy to consult for them. At six times his hourly pay, after taxes and administrative costs, of course. After a few days of wrangling and trying to negotiate, they had to accept. And then he sprung the patent issue on them, forcing them to pay for those two. Less than two and a half week after being fired he was back at his desk. After roughly three months, the firing came to the labor board. The employer stated that they believed they had handled the issue correctly, but were still willing to offer my friend's father his position back, in the interest of goodwill and reconciliation. My friend's father and the union simply stated that he was now employed elsewhere, at his own company, and no longer available. The labor board ruled in my friend's father's and the union's favor, and he got the normal damages, three months pay damage and 24 months pay severance package, including pension and of course the lawyer costs of the union paid by the employer. According to my friend, her father continued to work there until he retired, working 20 hours or so per week and 10 to 15 hours for other companies, making a pretty penny, continuing to charge them three times what he charged their competitors as in butthole tax. The managers were not fired, but they were moved into their own group apart from the rest of the department when it came to bonus calculations, the costs of her father's consultancy fees and the costs of the labor board arbitration were budgeted there, meaning they were constantly over budget and thus ineligible for bonuses for several years, which was a decent percentage of the incentives at that company, making at least one of them quit. My friend also said her father usually met any management complaints with a big shit eating grin and a, what are you going to do? Fire me? After that. Thank you for watching Royal AI. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive future episodes. Share your experience in the comments, or tell us what you think of these stories.